Awesome. Okay, now I'm going to introduce our first speaker here. This is Kara Klein, and she is the George Mason Student President of the Democrats. Here she is. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, my name is Kara Klein. I'm the president of the George Mason Democrats. And I'm so excited to see all your faces. It's incredible that so many of you guys are so politically active and are so excited um, for Andrew Yang. It just goes to show that we are going to win in 2020. <laughs> but before that, we have a really important election right here in Virginia tomorrow, OK? <laughs> It's super, super exciting that Andrew Yang recognizes how important this election is for us, and that's why he's here today. So I'm here to talk a little bit about that election. So I'm sure most of you guys know and are already planning on voting, right? Everyone's planning on voting. <laughs> well, I know a lot of you guys are students here on campus and are most likely registered to vote on campus. So if you are registered to vote on campus, you can vote tomorrow from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. at Merton Hall right here on campus. It's super, super nice, super easy. Between classes, just walk over to Merton Hall, go vote. Really, really important that you all do it, okay? If you're all here today, you all need to vote. In 2017, control of the House of Delegates in Virginia was decided by one vote. Okay, it's really sad. So we need to make sure that does not happen again and we're not picking the um, delegate out of a film canister like we did in 2017. So your vote counts, your vote is your voice, use it. People fought for our right to vote, so make sure you are using that vote, okay? Just to wrap up what I was saying before, it's super, super important that we all are getting out to vote tomorrow because it is going to set the tone for 2020. And you all obviously are so, so excited for 2020 and ready to vote next year. So the world is watching us. The country is watching us tomorrow. So get out and vote. Um, <laughs> Now, I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker. His name is um, Steven Stavrakis. He is the Virginia Regional Organizer for Yang Gang. Thank you, guys. Hello? Hello, Yang Gang! I love you, too. Ah, oh, man. I think it is safe to say one of the reasons that we love Andrew Yang is because he trusts us, Americans, with the facts. Now, I like facts. Do, I, do any of you like facts? I don't know. Any? Okay. That's awesome. And that's great because I'm on stage tonight to tell you a fact that you might not know. And that fact is this. On March 3rd, Super Tuesday, Andrew Yang is going to landslide Virginia. My name is Steven Savrakis. I am the regional organizer for the state of Virginia. And about a month ago, I was in a call with some other regional organizers. And we were talking about what we thought of our respective chances of winning our states. And the regional organizer from North Carolina asked me, Steve, do you think that Andrew Yang is going to win Virginia? And I said the only answer I had, which is, I don't know. And when we are talking about the future of our country, that answer is not good enough. So here's what I did. That night, I got on my computer, I got on Google, I found some numbers, and I did some math. And what that math said, that math said, we win. Because when you look at Virginia, when you look at a state and you see a flourishing Northeast that benefits from technology and investment and a rural red Southwest that never recovered from the 2008 financial crisis, when you see 
a state where on a list of 20 counties with the highest mortality rate due to drug overdoses, 17 of those counties voted for Donald Trump in 2016. But we understand why. It's because they weren't thinking harder. And that's why we're here. Because Virginia is a state which straddles the line between abundance and scarcity. So when I know all that, I see that, and somebody asks me, Steve, do you think that Andrew Yang can landslide Virginia? There is only one correct answer, and it is a resounding yes. So, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do, what we all are going to do. First, we are going to put Andrew Yang on the ballot in Virginia, and then we will win! And that, that is a fact. Who are we? We are Yang Gang. Yang Gang, Yang Gang, Yang Gang, Yang Gang. And what are we going to do? We are going to make America think harder. Make America think harder. Make America think harder. And why, and why are we gonna do that? We're gonna do that because if we, if we wanna put up a candidate in this presidential election that beats Donald Trump, we need to put up Andrew Yang because who beats Trump? I don't think uh, the campus could hear you. I said, who beats Trump? Yeah. That is right. Thank you for your time. I <laughs> I'd like to introduce the George Mason University caucus chair for Andrew Yang. Maddock Kimball. Good evening, George Mason. So I'm Maddock Kimball, and I am the GMU Andrew Yang Caucus Chair here. Um, and so what that means is I work with our lovely George Mason Democrats and all of our other uh, chair for candidates to really inform the campus about this incredible competitive primary we have going on. But first and foremost, I'm Mr. Andrew Yang's representative on campus. So I'm bringing talented and passionate people to our team. Um, I'm working, as Stephen said, to get him on the ballot. And I'm working with the Northern Virginia Yang Gang and the Yang Gang all around the state to do similar incentives. So that's why we are so incredibly proud and humbled to be able to host the candidate here tonight. Can I hear some excitement for that? Yeah! George Mason University is the largest and most diverse four-year public university in the state. Yeah! We're also home to some of the most politically active student chapters on the entire eastern seaboard. Okay? Yeah. Every student in this room tonight is a beneficiary to university that offers a plethora of opportunities and resources to succeed and further your own personal education right at your fingertips. And that's why it runs so parallel with the Andrew Yang campaign, which is all about providing agency and opportunity to every American citizen regardless of background. It's why we have such a diverse and incredibly passionate community that have coalesced around this campaign and this candidate and his ideas. And it's what brought me personally so early on following this race practically since Donald Trump was inaugurated. So what exactly does the GMU Yang Gang do? Well, as Stephen says, we are working tirelessly to make sure that come Super Tuesday, there are two words on your ballot. 
Andrew, and Yang. And not just that, so that you can proudly put your vote down for that candidate on Super Tuesday. We're also working really hard on growing our base here on campus. We're, tomorrow, you're going to see us at Merton Hall, collecting signatures so that even when we blow past the requisite tonight, we're gonna keep building that so that there is no doubt in question with Virginia, Virginia Department of Elections who is on the ballot come Super Tuesday. If you're interested in getting more involved with us on campus, reach out to me or one of our student volunteers after this or in any of the days to come. You're gonna be seeing a lot more of us and in bigger numbers. Andrew Yang is providing real solutions to the real problems that Americans face. He's a voice for truth and the American people, and we are so incredibly proud to host him here tonight. Can I hear some excitement from the crowd for that fact? It's now my great honor to introduce one of our leaders up here in Northern Virginia Yang Gang, A.J. Sutton, who's been instrumental in getting him here tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am, it is an honor and a privilege to be welcoming you here at GMU, the best college in Virginia. Is that right? I love GMU. I am here to talk to you for, for one reason and one reason only, and that is to get Andrew Yang on the ballot in Virginia. And we start off by doing math, because that is what we do at Yang Gang Rallies. So we need 5,000 signatures from Virginia residents to get Andrew Yang on the ballot. We need 200 in each congressional district. There are 11 congressional districts. So far, we have 3,000 signatures. And that is because of the hard work we have on the ground. We've been working so hard that the Yang campaign decided to not start a field office because we've been organized and active in getting out there. Yeah. Our Yang gang goes the distance, and I mean that literally. Kate drove up from South Carolina today. We have a Keisha leading the charge. She drove down from Delaware. We have, we have Maddox leading the charge here at GMU. And the people local here, and we have Catherine coming from Southeast in New Hampton Road. We have Tara, who drove out here from Blacksburg. And here at home, we have some of our strongest volunteers, like Jeff, who stepped up and printed out 1,000 buttons by hand just for this rally. And we had a seven-year-old lady who was wheelchair-bound that came out to one of our very first Yang Gang events. She was so inspired by Andrew Yang that she wanted to come and volunteer. Most importantly, woo, that's Wendy. And most importantly, our strongest core of volunteers are our young people, like Brandon, who's under 18 and is one of our best, who goes out there and volunteers every week. Our the future of our generation, we have to choose. The young people understand this. We are choosing between a future that is Star Trek and a future that is Mad Max. That is what we are choosing between this election. No Mad Max, no. All right, and so how are we gonna get Andrew Yang on the ballot here in Virginia? Three ways. First, if you are registered to vote here in Virginia, who's registered to vote? Yeah. If you haven't signed the petition yet, we have people collecting petition signatures outside. Go outside, sign the, ballot, sign the petition to get Andrew Yang on the ballot. Second, if you're motivated, if you can become a volunteer, we have these wonderful clipboard packages that Jeff put together. They have buttons, pens, all sorts of petition signature pages. Go out there, go to the volunteer table, see Jessica, and get one of these clipboards and she will get you started. Hi. Jessica, is also one of our record holders for the most number of signatures gathered in a day at 125, and she is our volunteer coordinator. If you can beat her record, you become the volunteer coordinator. Right. The, and finally, if, I'm just kidding, by the way, no. But finally, if you don't have time, I understand, Call of Duty came out last week. You, you, have, you have midterms, maybe you're working while in school, you can still volunteer and help out because you're gonna to go tomorrow and vote at the polls, right? 
I have here your budget clipboard. It is a manila folder with three petition signature pages. We will be throwing these at you as you are exiting the door. There's instructions in here. Grab one of these, go out tomorrow, vote, and then ask people for signatures. Let's put some on the stage here. And it, and it, woo. It's really easy to do. Grab a pen, head out there, and I can just do an example. All you have to do is walk up, vote, walk outside the poll, wait, and when people come out, just ask them, hey, can you sign a petition to get Andrew Yang on the ballot? We need 5,000 signatures. And they will sign because they just registered a vote and they're motivated. Yeah. Woo. If we do this right, we get Andrew Yang on the ballot at the end of the day tomorrow. And you don't want to hear me speak anymore. That's all we have because we need to get our next president of the United States here on the stage. Please welcome Mr. Andrew Yang. Wow. People here in the front, I want you to turn around and see what I see. Look at this. There is so much beautiful humanity in this room tonight, Virginia. And we are going to, I love you too. We are going to make history in 2020. You can see it. I just came back from Iowa. How many of you saw the Iowa speech? Oh, that was so much fun. You go out, there's a smoke machine. I need to buy one of those. <laughs> but we came out of there, and then the best part, in addition to the journalist saying to the team on the site, it's like, I'm not allowed to say this, but your man gave the speech of the night. But the best part is we leave that night and we campaign in Iowa the next day and the crowds are bigger, the energy's higher, and at every stop, people were like, I saw you on Friday night and I had to come find you. So we just touched down here in Virginia because you all are about to pick up the baton. You've got this incredibly important election day tomorrow. And Virginia, Virginia's on the precipice. Virginia is going very, very purple. And with just a bit of a push, I think Virginia's going to go blue. What do you think? It's going to go deep. Navy, math, yang gang, blue. I want to give a shout out to, to Dylan, who is on the stage and is recovering. He's right there and he's doing great. Let's give Dylan a round of applause. I was like. I also got, want to give a hand to Matic, AJ, Steve, and the rest of the incredible activists and leaders of the Yang Gang here in Virginia that have brought us together, as well as the George Mason Democrats. But it is their passion and leadership that is going to make tomorrow a huge day for the campaign in the Yang Gang. Really all for you. I want to get a sense of this. How many of you all are actually GMU students? I'm going to get this out. Wow, I have done the math. <laughs> that seems like about 40% about of you are GMU students. It seems like a lot of you have seen me speak in some context before, watched a YouTube video. Raise your hand if you've seen me speak before in some context. 
the, the rest of you, the rest of you didn't have your hands up. You're what I call Yang Curious. <laughs> you can jump on in, the water is fine. So I'm going to go through uh, what got me into the race in the first place. Most of you know this about me. I was certainly not someone who was brought up to think I was ever going to run for president. No, that was not the conversation in the Yang household. And I, <laughs> I have the fashion choices to prove it. Now, like so many of you who are students here, I was told my job was to try and do well in school. And I get the sense that many of you are like me, either first or second generation born in this country. Like, raise your hand if that was last year. There are a lot of people here. So I know, for, particularly for people whose families are relatively new to the country, it's like get good grades, make your way, uh, get credentialed. And so I tried to do that. I went to law school. Some of you, I can sense, are going to go to law school. Just like about that feel. I'm not sure if that's applause worthy, honestly. <laughs> Spent five unhappy months as a corporate lawyer, uh, and then I left to try and start a business. And I'll tell you, starting a business is the hardest thing you ever have to do. It's up there with having a kid. Those two are the hardest things I've ever done. Uh, running for president's probably up there too, somewhere in, in there. Though I gotta say, running for president is getting easier and easier because we're gonna win this whole thing. <laughs> So I started a business, had failure, and then some success. And in 2009, I was shaken by the financial crisis and what was transpiring around the country. And I thought I had some insight as to why this had happened, Virginia. I thought that so many of the wannabe whiz kids I'd gone to college and law school with had gone to Wall Street and dreamt up these exotic financial instruments that had crashed the economy. And I said, wow, what a disaster. <laughs> what a train wreck. And so the question is, what the heck can you do that's better than that? And I said, well, I think I know of something. I would love for people to head to places like Detroit and Cleveland and Birmingham and Baltimore and St. Louis and start businesses and do something productive that people would be excited about, that you'd be excited about. Because right now we're pushing you in certain directions and not others. So I spent seven years traveling the country as the head of a nonprofit, I'd started Adventure for America. Got honored by the Obama administration, so I got to meet the president a couple of times. And I was blown away by the disparities between some parts of this country and others. I have the sense that many of you are students here, many of you probably grew up in this part of the country. How many of you all grew up in the Midwest? How about the South? West Coast? D.C. metro area? Yeah. <laughs> I thought so, and then north, northeast like me. So I spent seven years working in the Midwest and the South, and I was staggered by the gulf between Michigan and Manhattan, or St. Louis and San Francisco, where you make that trip, you feel like you're crossing dimensions or decades or ways of life, and not just a few time zones. But I was still stunned when Donald Trump became our president in 2016. And to me, this was a giant red flag. If you watched cable news, why would you think Donald Trump's our president today? Russia, racism, Facebook, the FBI, Hillary Clinton, emails, all mashed together into some kind of bizarre stew. That is what's being sold to you on cable news. But I'm a numbers guy, Virginia. I did the math. And to me, the clear reason why Donald Trump won is that we automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs that were in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Iowa, where I just left. And when a factory closes, blue goes to red in an awful hurry. There's a straight line up between the adoption of industrial automation in a voting area and the movement to Trump. And unfortunately, we're not going to stop there. How many of you have noticed stores and malls closing uh, in your hometowns and where you live? And why are those stores closing? Amazon. That's right, Amazon soaking up $20 billion in business every single year. They do it like this too. They make their hand into a claw like this. <laughs> Apparently, if you do this for a little while, you get $20 billion a year. How much did Amazon pay in federal taxes last year? That's right, that's the brutal math, Virginia. 20 billion out. 
20 billion out, zero back. The average retail clerk whose store and mall is closing is a 39-year-old woman making between $9 and $10 an hour. What is her next move when the store closes, when the mall closes? When you all call the customer service line of a big company, you do the same thing I do, which is what? You dial 000, human, 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 say representative, representative, until you get someone on the line. Raise your hand if that's what you do. Oh yeah, we all do it. Because that, that software is miserable. You're like, oh, you know, and they gave me a human. But in two or three short years, the software is gonna sound like this. Hey, Andrew, how's it going? What can I do for you? It'll be seamless, efficient, a little bit sexy, perhaps. <laughs> what is that going to mean for the two and a half million Americans who work in call centers right now making $14 an hour? <laughs> How many of you have seen a self-serve kiosk in a fast food restaurant in McDonald's? They're going to be in every location in the United States by 2021 in McDonald's, and the other chains are going to follow suit. It's going to start in the front of the house and move to the back of the house. Being in food service or food preps, the third most common job in our country. Most common job in 29 states is driving a truck. How many of you all know a truck driver? I know, they know Fred. <laughs> I know Fred too. Yeah, Fred. For those of you who don't know, Fred's a truck driver who let me ride in his truck and, and now uh, he has my face on his truck. And it's something like, you know, 50 feet long and 30 feet high, and I was like, whoa. First time I saw it, it was quite a sight. Fred is excited about the campaign because he realizes that we're in the process of trying to automate his job and the jobs of the three and a half million truckers in this country. My friends in California are working on self-driving trucks right now. They tell me they are 98% of the way there. And the way they think they can get the last 2% is by equipping the trucks with 5G-enabled teleoperating equipment, where when the truck's not sure what to do, a human operator will beam in from Nevada or Arizona and drive it like a video game. That's how they think they can get the last 2%. $168 billion a year, Virginia, is what's at stake. That's enough money to do incredible things. That's why some of my friends, some of the smartest people in the country are working on it right now. What's that going to mean for Fred and the three and a half million truckers in this country or the seven million Americans who work in truck stops, motels, and diners that rely upon the truck stopping every day? The Democrats are acting like Donald Trump is the source of all of our problems. He is not. He is a symptom. He's a manifestation of the fact that we're going through the greatest economic transformation in our country's history. What experts are calling the fourth industrial revolution. When is the last time you heard a politician even say the words fourth industrial revolution? Yeah. Just now. Yeah. And I am barely a politician. Yeah. That's one reason we're going to win. Oh, I confess, my first move was not to run for president. I came here to the D.C. area and I met with various leaders. And I said, what are we going to do to help our fellow Americans understand it is not immigrants that are causing these problems. When you go to the factory in Michigan or Ohio, it is not wall-to-wall -wall immigrants. It's wall-to-wall -wall robot arms and machines. Same thing in the Amazon Fulfillment Center. And I'm going to riff just a little bit. I have some insight. Jeff Bezos believes there is one threat to Amazon, and that threat is the US government. Not coincidentally, HQ2, here in the DC metro area, he just glued a couple penthouses together and said, one was not enough. I need two, glue them together. No, bought the Washington Post with a pocket change in his sofa, unfortunately. <laughs> this is what's at stake. They look around and they see, hey, we're paying zero in taxes right now. We kind of like that. You know, when the accountants come in at the end of the year and say, hey, Jeff, great news, zero taxes again. And then Jeff's like, great. And then what does Jeff do? Jeff goes into his vault, takes out bags of gold coins, gives them to each accountant, and then they go home and take a little Scrooge McDuck gold coin bath. <laughs> it's like their annual ritual. Virginia, is it their fault that they're paying zero in taxes? No. no, it is our fault, and we're gonna put a stop to it, am I right? Yeah. 
We are going to rewrite the rules of the 21st century economy so that they work for us, they work for you. And for the young people in particular here in this audience, if you have this sinking feeling that we have left you a god-awful mess, we have. It should be a source of national shame what a shambles we have left you. It's true. You look up and you're like, okay, how did college get so freaking expensive? It got two and a half times more expensive than when I went, and it has not gotten two and a half times better. No. no. It is a symptom of the disease, the disease where everything revolves around the almighty dollar in this country. And it's turning us all into these rats in a maze. We're like scrambling around trying to justify our own market value. And it is time to dispel this confusion in America that economic value and human value are the same things. They are not. And this is what threatens to turn us against each other and destroy us. Because in the era of artificial intelligence, it doesn't matter if the trucker was hardworking and conscientious or not. The robot truck is going to zoom past him all the same. And it's not just the truckers, it's the radiologists, it's the pharmacists, it's the lawyers. I did that job long enough to know that you can automate a lot of that job. Oh, you laugh. I mean, that's one, re one reason when you were saying you're going to law school. I mean, if you look into it, AI can edit contracts faster, more efficiently, more inexpensively than the best human lawyer at this point. Oh, well, it's true. And so the meritocracy that you have been sold, young people in particular, is crumbling around you. And you sense this. You sense that you're being fed a bill of goods, that there's like this ladder up, but the ladder just gets more and more expensive, and you're not sure it's going to lead to what's been promised. This is what we have to fix, but we cannot do it without your help. As an adult, I am ashamed of what we have left you. We owe you better. I'm a parent, and I'm ashamed of the world we are leaving to our kids. This is why I'm running for president, Virginia. We have to let our fellow Americans know what the real problems are so that we can solve them. Donald Trump, getting him out of office will not make all of these problems go away. Artificial intelligence is still going to get faster and smarter. The robot trucks are going to come closer to the highways. Amazon will still be paying zero in taxes. We have to rewrite the rules. They work for us. They work for you, particularly the young people. Now, if you are here in this room, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I love thinking about this, the first time you heard it, that there's an Asian man running for president who wants to give everyone $1,000 a month. And I do. And best of all, with your help, I will. And the first time you heard it, it sounded like a gimmick or a joke. But this is not my idea, and it is not a new idea. Thomas Paine was for it at the founding of our country. Martin Luther King fought for it in the 60s, and it is what he was fighting for when he was killed in 1968. A thousand economists endorsed it in the 60s. Passed the U.S. House of Representatives twice in 1971 under Nixon, of all people. It came this close to being law. It's called the Family Assistance Plan. And I talked to someone in Democratic politics, the reason it passed the House and not the Senate was that Democrats in the Senate wanted an even higher income threshold. And someone who worked in Democratic politics at that time told me it was the biggest screw up that they'd ever made. And if they'd just taken that deal, every family in the United States would have been guaranteed a certain level of income from 1971 till today. Can you imagine if they had made that move? Then 11 years later, one state did pass a dividend where everyone in that state now gets between one and two thousand dollars a year, no questions asked. And what state is that? Alaska. And how does Alaska pay for it? Oil. And what is the oil of the 21st century? 
technology, AI, self-driving cars and trucks. A study just came out that said that our data is now worth more than oil. Where is all that data money going? Google, Amazon, Facebook, and the trillion dollar tech companies that pay zero or near zero in taxes. And I am just like you. When you see that long, weird legal agreement with I agree or I consent at the bottom, we all just scroll through that thing and hit the button. I have a law degree and I'm not reading that shit. It's a pretend choice. Know what I mean? They're like pretending you made an active, affirmative decision. You did not. What we have done is we have forfeited our data to the, to the mega tech companies for these free, fantastic services, but the deal is going darker and darker on us. It is. You know, it seemed like too good to be true. Turns out it was too good to be true. Because now they are selling and reselling and repackaging our data over and over again, profiting to the tune of tens of billions of dollars, and we are seeing none of it. All that happens to us is that occasionally we get a message saying, hey, you might want to change your password. <laughs> and then you're like, I have a feeling you're telling me this because something has gone wrong. And they're like, oh, no, not so bad, but you can probably change it. <laughs> I, I mean. And you're like, oh, am I going to change it? Like, yeah, what's the worst that could happen? Like, maybe my data gets stolen. Like, it'll be OK. You know? But even worse, it's actually corroding our democracy, our sense of agency, our decision making. I have to say, it's embarrassing that Mark Zuckerberg is clinging to the like, oh, we can't decide what's true, what's not true, too hard. Oh. I have a feeling if Facebook was making money on it, they would figure it out. Do you agree? Yeah. Freaking embarrassing. <laughs> this freedom dividend that seems so fantastic initially, it's actually common sense and inevitable in a time of unprecedented economic change. Because after I'm your president and we pass this dividend, where will the money go in real life? How are you going to spend it? So what I heard, school loans, music, car repairs, how much of it would stay where you live and work and go to school? Most of it, not all of it. You would upgrade the Netflix, you'd get your own Netflix password really is what happened. <laughs> you'd stop passing around your friends to the point where some of you would get locked out periodically. And then you're like, oh, this is irritating. I guess eight of us are using it at the same time. So now, post-freedom dividend, you will get your own. It will be a glorious day. <laughs> so some of it's going to float up to the cloud, but most of it's going to go right into daycare and car repairs and little league signups and student loans and uh, in textbooks and everything else. This is the trickle up economy, Virginia, from you all, your people, your families, and your communities up. This is the op opposite of the trickle-down garbage that's been weakening us for years. And, I love you too. And this is the vision. This is the mission. This is what we're going to make real in the days to come. My campaign just raised $10 million last quarter. <laughs> in increments of only $30 each. So my fans are almost as cheap as Bernie's. I love you for it. This is a very cheap, wholesome gang to join. I, we just got some gang members who were supporting Beto, too, and I appreciate the heck out of everyone who supported Beto. There are people here in this room for that. And when we put up that $10 million number, Virginia, there was a tremor in the political world. They said, what just happened? How the heck 
did Andrew Yang, who no one had ever heard of eight months ago, just put up $10 million. And the way we did it is that the people of this country, you all, are a sleeping giant. You know? And this campaign is the smelling salts, Virginia. We're going to wake the people up one by one. And they're going to look up and they're going to say, wait a minute, we can do that? And we're in a democracy. We are the owners and shareholders of this country. If enough of us get together and say we want an economy that works for us in the 21st century, it will become reality like that. Then it's not just the fact that this money in our hands would make us healthier, mentally healthier, less stressed out, would improve our relationships, would improve our decision making would improve our graduation rates, would decrease domestic violence, would decrease hospital visits. And not, it's not just all of those things. It's that our very goals as a society have to move forward as well. Right now, how are we measuring our economic and social progress? GDP. Yes, Yang Gang. And how many of you were excited about GDP when you woke up this morning? <laughs> Only at a Yang Gang rally do we boo GDP, and I love it. Instead of GDP, we should be using your health, your debt load, your mental health and freedom from substance abuse, clean air and clean water, the ability to retire with dignity. I want nothing to do with living in a country where I walk into a convenience store and I see a senior citizen working himself or herself to the bone because there is no other way to survive. That person should be someplace enjoying their golden years and that should be a teenager in that convenience store working for beer money. We have to actually change the goals of our economy. And as your president, I will update this archaic, century-old GDP number that's riding us off a cliff, that's driving us off a cliff, and replace it with an American scorecard with the real measurements that I will present to you all and all of our fellow Americans every year at the State of the Union. I'm going to be the first president. That's right. It'll be on a PowerPoint deck. I'm kind of old school. I still use PowerPoint instead of, uh, instead of like Prezi and like the Google. It's on this. It's if you like the idea of a president presenting that information to you at the State of the Union every year, then you're definitely Yang Gang, because that's like, definitely something. Like I want to talk a little bit about how we win. Like, you come out tonight, we're going to have a, a fun rallying, I'm going to sign some things, but the way we win, the way I have succeeded in life is by paying attention to the key variables that actually drive success. And tonight, that is actually not what I'm talking about. That is what the people in front of me were talking about. We need people here. If you're registered to vote, go ahead and yell if you're registered to vote. And if you are not, you should definitely pretend. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but if you're registered to vote, we need you to make sure and sign a clipboard before you leave here tonight. Can you do that for me, Yang Yang? Yeah. If we do that, then we'll have hundreds of signatures that will get us closer to this goal of 5,000. And you gotta say, the way it works is that the Secretary of State, they're kind of sticklers about this stuff. So what they do is they try and find reasons to reject signatures. So the requirement is 5,000, but if you wanna be safe, you've gotta put up 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000, because then if they're jerks, then you're like, hey, we're still over 5,000, so shut up! So right now we're at around 3,000 and we need to clear eight, nine, 10,000 and we need your help to do so. Being an entrepreneur, being an operator, it's not about frankly the hype, it's about making sure you actually succeed at the ground level. 
It's one of the reasons why I'm proudest of this campaign, because of all the smoke, all of the incredible success. You know what gets me most excited? Is when I get to call someone and tell them that they're getting $1,000 a month for a year. That's incredible. He's like, call me. Let's call the entire country. Am I right? So I want you to translate this vision into action. We need you to make sure and sign a petition. And then if you want to go the extra mile and be a superhero and a champ, we need you to go vote tomorrow. But then when you vote, bring a clipboard with you and just say, hey, you want to sign this petition to get Andrew Yang on the ballot here in Virginia? You get a few dozen people. We get enough of you to do that. I mean, we're going to be done like that. Because, I... <laughs> know what I mean? Uh, look, at, look at it, if 200 of you get 50, that's 10,000, we're done, you know? Yeah. Do you want to help us finish this off, Virginia? And this is the same way it will be when I'm your president. One thing that I dislike about being president is it seems like a lot of it's about how you make people feel, which is cool, feelings are good. But then it's also trying to get down to the roots of the problem and the guts and see if you can improve people's lives beyond the feeling in terms of their mental health and debt load and everything else. You know what I mean? It's the same thing. One of my dreams as your president is to be able to go and actually just get into the guts and solve the problems. I want to get out of the White House a lot when you're president and not in like this Air Force One caravan and do some kind of nonsense like hangar. I just want to like show up to things, help figure out problems, and then take some of the vast resources in our society and help solve those problems for us, the American people. That is the vision. Because the biggest lie in America today is that we don't have the money. It's such nonsense. We're at $21 trillion a year, the richest, most advanced economy in the history of the world. Do you all remember voting for the $4 trillion bailout of Wall Street? No. Do you remember anyone complaining, where are we going to get the money? No. But then when it's our turn, oh, they're like, oh, no, we're broke, we're broke. Oh, no, we are not broke. We're the opposite of broke. Oh, it's true. I, I just put it this way, like, we are broke. <laughs> the country, country not broke. And I remember the reason why I quit my job to start a nonprofit. After the financial crisis, I saw what we did. We had a choice between the banks and our people who are losing their homes, and we chose the banks. And I said, that was the wrong choice. This time we're going to choose our people. Am I right, Virginia? Yes, we're going to build a trickle-up economy. We're going to present a new way forward. And I want to walk you through, because some of you are here, you're young, curious. You're like, ooh, this guy's interesting. Can he win? Oh, I can win. The number one criteria for Democrats in this primary is beating Donald Trump, wall to wall. And when you dig in, you find that there's one candidate that's drawing in, Libertarians, yeah. Independents, yeah. as well as Democrats and Progressives, yeah. and even disaffected Donald Trump voters. Yeah. We can build a much broader coalition to beat Donald Trump in 2020. There is one poll that came out that said that I am one of only two candidates in the field that 10% or more of Donald Trump voters would support in the general election. And, and a friend of mine whose mom is an avid Fox watcher, she said that the only Democrat I would support is that Yang fellow because he does not seem to judge me at all.
And it's true. I just want to solve her problems. I just want to solve all of our problems. We can come together. I can help bring a fractured country together because people sense, I just want to move us forward. It's not left, it's not right, it's forward. And that is where you are going to take the country in 2020, Virginia. We need your help. Are you going to help us get these signatures? Are you going to help make America think harder? Am I going to come right here back to Northern Virginia next year as your president? It's all true. Thank you, Virginia. Let's fight. Let's fight for our future. We will be proud to leave to my kids, to you all, to your kids, and make history together in this election in 2020. I love you all. That they wishing on me Hope I got some brothers that outlive me They gon' tell the story Shit was different to me God's plan God's plan I hold back sometimes I won't yeah. I feel good sometimes I don't like, yeah. I finesse down Western Road hey, yes. Might go down to G.O.D. Yeah, I go hard on Southside G yeah, wait. I make sure that Northside E Bad things, it's a lot of bad things that they wish and they wish and they wish and they wish and they wish on me.